both present here and those joining us virtually. On behalf of the Board of Directors of the Institute for Christian Impact, as well as the as well as the leadership team, it is my joy to welcome us all to this evening's consultative dialogue. We in ICI believe that we are Africans by God's appointment, that we are placed in the nations we live in by God's preordained purpose, according to Act 1726, who out of one man created all men and has predetermined not only how long we should live, but the exact places of our habitation. But we also believe we are here to serve a purpose, just as King David did, serving God's purpose in his generation as well as all the saints. We believe in a mission for a bright continent, Africa, through which African nations will thrive and experience God's shalom for the common good of their citizens. So we are firm with Dr. James Quetil Agri of Ghana that only the best, only the best is good enough for Africa. According to him, my people of Africa were created in the image of God, but men have made us think we are chickens. And we still think we are, but we are eagles. Stretch forth your wings and fly. Don't be content with food for chickens. It is in view of this, and in view of happenings around us, not only in Ghana, but in the entire West Africa sub-region, that you have organized this consultative dialogue as part of our ongoing commitment to Christian witness in the public sphere where the rubber meets the road. We are convinced that the territorial integrity of any nation depends on the moral integrity of all citizens, particularly Christians, called upon to bring the Lordship of Christ to bear on all spheres of engagement not only in church. The need to reveal the walls of Jerusalem through Nehemiah was occasioned by the collapse both of the territorial integrity of Israel as a nation, which was actually caused by the failure of their moral integrity. We do not want that to happen to us. So we want to preempt that by reflecting together, among other things, on the significant question of this that they're doing to ensure that we affect our generation with the values of our faith, Christianity. The theme, of course, conjures what can we do, which we can expand further to. What are we doing? What must be done? Or why are we not doing what we should do? Integrity is a topic that has taken center stage. And we usually like to talk about it for somebody else, somebody else's integrity. And um, this time, like our integrity that is coming to bear on what is happening in our government. We know that governments are uniquely released to power, authority, politics, policy, administration, government, management, and the steering of organizations. It's important, of course, to note that the motivation to agree on investing trust in institutions and people necessitates the need for a guarantee. And integrity is such a guarantee because then we are expecting that significant impact will be made 
and that the struggle between the common good and the good of the few who have been entrusted with responsibility to be taken care of. Individual, organization, and national integrity ensures that society is stable. And as Christian citizens, the responsibility to ensure the promotion of integrity is so fundamental to our lives and to peace. That is what God is going to demand from us. So the key words, wholeness and coherence, professional responsibility, moral reflection values, like not being corruptible, laws and rules, moral values and norms, and exemplary behavior. All these are very pertinent to the best survival of the common good. And the Christian citizen has a responsibility as the witness of Christ in our world. Because of this conversation, since we are talking about the challenge of integrity in governance and the responsibility of the Christian citizens, our code of moral values must be the Christian scriptures. And that means that based on Webster's definition of integrity, we can define the word as a firm adherence to the principles and the teachings of the word of God. In other words, doing what is right and acceptable before God. And to illustrate our responsibility as Christian citizens when it comes to integrity in governance, I'd like for us to begin with the story of Rahab as it is found in Joshua chapter 2. Now Rahab was a prostitute in Jericho who, who played a strategic role in the victory that Israel had over Jericho because she knew the importance of doing what is right and acceptable before God. She wasn't an MP. She wasn't a DCE. She wasn't any type of politician or member of government. She was a citizen. She wasn't even a Jew. She was a Canaanite woman. And yet she knew that the only way for herself and the nation of Israel to be victorious was to do what was right and acceptable before God. It is for this reason that she placed a premium on her words and did as she had promised. And that is what I believe is the challenge of integrity in governance in this country. And it is that the 70% plus of us Christians in this country do not place a premium on what is right and acceptable before God. And it reflects in every aspect of society. It reflects in the way we and our children throw rubbish on the streets without a care for the fact that when it rains, that rubbish is going to clog our neighbor's gutter. That neighbor who we claim as Christians that we love as we love ourselves. It reflects in the way the coal tar on the road is half the thickness that it needs to be, leading to potholes that have caused accidents, some of which have cost people their very lives. And yet, after the funeral, when the road contractor walks into the church to pay tithes from the money that was gleaned from the tar that should have been on the road, then we call him to the front of the church. My main issue with us was that it, it, it's good to celebrate excellence and exceptional behavior and reward good things. But if returning 8,000 CDs is the exceptional and the norm, then we are basically have time. So while not condemning those who were giving him money for that, I was asking why we were so shocked and enamored. And is it that good examples are so few? So I don't know, something happened and I just went on a tangent and started firing the sermons to preach in church and all of that. And I'm happy I'm not the first one to fire. And because we have the fire, I won't, I won't go fire again. I'm just I relax. For professional journalists, they are based in the US. And they have nine principles of journalism. These are like ideals because I don't know any journalist who lives by all. You know? And the, the first one they say is that journalism's first obligation is to the truth. And it sounds simple for anybody, but if you're a believer and you know the truth is a person, that means that your obligation, because you see, you can report facts. I always tell people that 
if you you see somebody slap another person and you report that Bernard slapped this person, that is a fact. But that's just part of the truth because probably before the slap there was a provocation. And because we all see in from one side, reporting the truth is much more difficult than just spitting out facts. So for me, how, how I resolve that is to say, my obligation is not just to continually look for the truth, but I have a master who is the truth, right? And if I have met him, his standard is higher than all journalistic standards in the world. So I can do a program that everybody is praising, 